So um, this next session, which is going to take us till to lunch at 11.30, is um, really going to be a whirlwind look at a set of uh, compelling configurations of hybrid modeling, where we're weaving together two or more of these traditions, Asian-based modeling, system dynamics, and discrete event simulation. Uh, using each uh, for spheres of its strength. Um, and uh, I'm going to, well, well, I could spend more time on the theory associated with this. Um, uh, I think I'm going to dive into a lot of example models that illustrate these patterns. Okay, You'll find other videos of me commenting more deeply on why uh, hybrid modeling, for example, helps learning with modeling um, by allowing us to use the right tool for the job for different areas of the model and critically, critically, adjusting what tool we use as our understanding deepens. Allows us to take a model perhaps originally articulated one tradition um, and elaborate parts of it in a more detailed way um, with another tradition um, uh, and and to flexibly change the boundaries between the methods as our learning evolves, as we learn what extra detail we wish to retain in the model and which things we wish uh, we seek to gloss over, okay? Um, so that's really um, the goal here. We're gonna whip through a set of sort of types of, of configurations of these models and uh, example models from our library to illustrate them, okay? Um, uh, so that's the goal. I apologize for the um, uh, for the abbreviated nature of the discussion, but you can find uh, videos of me uh, uh, discussing uh, this in much greater detail um, and uh, elaborating particularly on the some of the uh, motivations for this. W one thing I just want to caution against. Um, uh, so I'm an old man. And when I first started doing research-based dynamic modeling in 1990, um, it was a very different world. And uh, the health sciences at that time were far, far more resistant to ideas from system science than now. Uh, there's really been a, a huge sea change since that point. And even in, in 2000, when I was doing really my first uh, uh, large scale professional work in this area, doing uh, large scale uh, health policy modeling, um, what I was doing was uh, was really viewed as, as quite outre, it was quite, you know, uh, bizarrely innovative um, at the time. Fast forward 25 years, quarter century, and it's a different world. Um, there's a lot more interest, it's a lot more funding, there's a lot more ready uh, opportunities to publish, there's a lot more collaborators, there's a lot more sources of data, uh, et cetera. But one inheritance, one unfortunate bequest with which we're still dealing from the uh, the earlier era, um, but which is now starting to fade is tribalism on the part of the different practi practitioners of the different methods, system dynamics, agent-based modeling, and discrete event simulation were largely practiced in sociological and technical isolation from one another. And when they encountered each other, it was, in a way, a clash of civilizations um, with the different parties trying to um, often one-up each other and prove that theirs was the better method or theirs was the truer method or theirs was the deeper method or theirs was the more general method, theirs was the more powerful method. And I have my share of scars from those wars because I, 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 I understood all three traditions. I practiced them. I looked for synergies. My job talk here at the university uh, about 20 years ago, my team um, was, uh, was based on combining different methods among other things. Um, 
But that was very much not part of the zeitgeist, the zeitgeist of the era, which was uh, very tribalistic. And I refused to, to, to favor one or the other. And, and I, was, I was pilloried for consorting with the wrong types of models by people in each tradition and so on, which, which I have very little patience for, um, very little sympathy for. Um, those things, those days have, have also faded. And there's more and more people who are, who are educated in more than one technique and recognize the tremendous synergies, the tr not just complementarity, but the synergies between these techniques. And uh, there's a growing literature on hybrid modeling and hybrid simulation, um, which encompasses uh, considering um, innovations, hybrid innovations in the modeling process, as well as in the models themselves. My student, Yuan Tian, who we were lucky to have for a one or two days here, but is unfortunately on her way to Korea right now for teaching there. Um, uh, she has a, a dissertation focused on, on participatory methods and hybrid models, and um, it's been an area our group has contributed in a prominent way. And some of the most powerful ways that we've contributed over the years have been hybrids, uh, not only of dynamic modeling with machine learning and computational statistics and other methods, but particularly hybrid modeling around of the different system science traditions. And this has really given us a very strong conviction of the tremendous utility, nay, the, the you know, really um, uh, huge values that's delivered, massive value that's delivered by hybrids. Um, there are some of my colleagues who are more old school from each tradition who complain about still about me not being sufficiently pure because I apply different methods. Um, that I'm, I'm somehow polluting a model by using it with other methods, or or that um, I think that, you know upon occasionally that these methods are are, are merely toys. Uh, you know, combining them is merely uh, intellectual exercise. Far from it. It's a super useful thing. And I think our pandemic model, um, which um, was used widely for decision making, weights modeling, which was used by uh, Saskatchewan to this day, but also by Yukon Territory, by Australia Capital Territory, and um, in being adopted at a, at a research level by um, uh, Alberta collaborators, you know, it's a case in point. I mean, the, the hybrid modeling was there from the get-go. Our work with eight diabetic end-stage renal disease, uh, our work with uh, spread of chlamydia, um, uh, different types of uh, communicable diseases, um, uh, health service delivery, uh, context, uh, hybrid modeling is front and center. But there's five compelling patterns that have come out of our work that I see again and again, where I would never want to live uh, doing work in this in this area without recourse to hybrid model. It adds so much more, as much as any one tradition. And I do believe that in some cases, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. It's not merely you get some of this and some of that and the whole is great. It's they synergize in really interesting ways. And the five broad ways are shown up here on the screen. Um, uh, and they involve cases where we depict a population using one model type, but service delivery using another model type. And you might imagine based on our, our discussion of it, that the service delivery is often with discrete event modeling and you would be discrete event simulation and you would be you would be arguing with reason. That's exactly right. You'd be accurate. Um, we'll see though four other types. And I want to illustrate each of these with models. We may not finish all of this before lunch, but we'll get a lot of the way through it. And if we have to go after lunch, we'll we'll finish it up much more quickly. Um, but uh, why, don't we, why don't we get started uh, with this, okay? So the first is this service uh, population interaction. And for this, I'd like to call up a model which, um, to which I will direct uh, you because it's, um, uh, it's a little bit uh, 
uh, buried, uh, as it were, um, in the in the set of models. So I'm going to see if I can call up um, the appropriate folder here. Um, and okay, um, um, Mumble. Let's let's go. So I'm going to go to the participant resources. Um, you folks can do, go there. You're saying uh, the same. Been there before and done that. Okay, so this is the lecture slides. I'm going to go instead, not in the lecture slides. I'm going to go to the uh, to the AnyLogic eight examples. So that's step one. I'll zoom out a little bit. While still being true to, to Nona's reminder to keep it zoomed in. And there's a hybrid models folder. Do you see that? Do people see that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Hybrid models. So it's in any logic eight examples under hybrid models. Okay. And if you go down here, um, there's something called multi-clinic SIS hybrid saturation effects and lock-in. And indeed that's what's called for on these uh, on these slides here, okay? Lock-in. So I'd like you with that to download it. In case you don't remember, you can right click on it and do download, or you can download it via this button here, okay? Now, this model has a lot, a lot of neat features, I gotta say. Um, it, uh, it has uh, several points of learning one can use with it. And uh, I'm sorry, did, does someone need help? Yeah, I think we're okay. Uh, I think Okay, sorry, is, is that, okay. So um, I'm trying to find where, where did, okay. Uh, why isn't it showing up right away? Okay, something is, is uh, somehow maybe I didn't download it properly, sorry. Okay, um, I'm gonna say download and, oh, it's zipping. Oh, I see it's zipping. I'm sorry, folks. I'm sorry, I screwed up. Okay, go down one more level. So you see the ALP file, and then you can download it. Okay, apologies. I I toned out. Go go. So so in hybrid, in any logic eight examples, go to hybrid models, and then in hybrid models, you'll find this folder. Double click on that and download the ALP file. Okay, I'm I'm sorry. I I downloaded the whole folder and. Messed everything up. Okay. Um, there we go. Um, and we're going to go to our downloads and we're gonna open this open this model. Okay. Um so um what's going on with the model? Let's let's situate ourselves a little bit. Um okay, so we have four points of structure, you know, a very high level structure in the model. We have main. But then we have a person agent, a home agent, and a clinic agent. And uh, the person agent has two state charts. They have a sex and income and home. Um, and, and then they have a state chart for in, infection status. You've seen that sort of thing before. Should, shouldn't be at all unfamiliar. And then, importantly, you have care-seeking state chart for um uh, to what degree they're seeking out care for their malady, for their infection, okay? The idea here is that they're getting infected and critically, this is A1 important, in order to recover, we treat their infection as being, uh, treat, uh, recovery is treatment mediating, meaning they have to receive treatment to recover from the infection, okay? Um, and... Uh, and, and so this recovery, which confers no ongoing immunity, they go back to the susceptible state 
um, they've been treated. You can think of it as kind of approximating cases where, you know, you have um, an infection like gonorrhea and you, you need to clear it through um, antibiotic treatment, antimicrobial treatment. treatment. Okay. Um, uh, in, in reality, there, there's natural recovery, but, but here we're treating things as, as, uh, as requiring treatment to clear it. Um, now, um, there are other constructs here that you're going to find familiar with. They're color, the count of times infected. You, you know, you've been through that, been there, done that, right? Um, okay. Uh, beyond that, though, I want to highlight that uh, this infection can spread. So in the infective state, they can spread to others, and someone is susceptible when they receive a message, they get exposed. You sh you've been through this, right? You recognize that basic pattern? Someone who's infective can spread it. Someone who's susceptible can get it. Do you recognize that from yesterday? If someone's here and they get the infected message, the exposed message, they'll get it infected. Someone here can spread it, right? Um, okay, so, so the spread of infection in the population, it occurs via their connections, okay, like before. Okay, um, so that's person. Home is a, is a kind of passive thing. It'll be a grouping of people, but double click on clinic. And you'll see clinic articulated in a way that uses the language of one of these types of modeling. What does this look like? We've seen it earlier this morning. This group event simulation. So we're capturing the structured workflow and we're capturing, in fact, resource dependencies here. So people come in, they're awaiting the healthcare worker. Um, once the healthcare worker is available, so while the no healthcare worker is available, they will queue. If they're there more than a certain period of time, they will leave. Um, so so this is shows leaving without being seen. Um, so uh, representing the fact that they may um, uh, they may balk um, after six hours, 300 minutes. Um, if they haven't been seen, they'll we view them as leaving. Um, otherwise, if they're seen within that time, they proceed to treatment. And treatment has a certain probability of, uh, of, of conferring a cure. And otherwise, it's a treatment failure. And there's a certain probability of treatment success when they're treated. Regardless of whether it's successful or a failure, they won't know that. They'll proceed to um, release any resources like the healthcare worker they were allocated, and they'll depart. So in short, they come in and they wait if the avail if the resource is not available. Now, the healthcare workers here right now, uh, there's um, uh, a capacity of healthcare workers given by this parameter, count healthcare workers per clinic. So I'm going to um, to go and I'm gonna close the others here so we don't get confused, but I'm gonna go to main here and you'll notice these parameters, okay? Count of clinics, count healthcare workers per clinic and count a certain probability of treatment success. Okay, so infection can spread. People need care in order to clear the infection. They're going to be spreading it as long as, you know, there's susceptibles around until they're treated. In order to get treatment, they have to go to a clinic and they have to wait until a healthcare worker is available. If it's not timely enough, they'll leave. Otherwise, they'll proceed through. But there's some chance it won't succeed and they'll leave. Okay. Okay. Can we run this thing? Are we okay with it? Okay. So let's run this. Let's run this model. Okay, um, and uh, I have some comments there, which you know you may find interesting. So here's some people starting, starting uh, in a state where they are uh, initially infected, um, and uh, yeah, they're exposed. They're starting exposed, 
and you can see that they're 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 at a home um and they can spread it to others at home and uh and it can spread within homes and uh it's spreading over time in terms of some illness counts so we're going to speed it up um here this is a uh prevalence of infection up here uh this is a uh, I believe uh, in, we can check. I think it's a um, uh, fract or number of people that are infected there. Um, wait, could you would you mind checking out? I remember this this graph. It's actually not. I think prevalence. If you, if you wouldn't mind checking that, I'd appreciate it. Um, and up here, um, what we see is the number of times that uh, people have gotten infected. Um, Okay, so can anyone say what what's happened here? Um, let's let's look. Um, there's a total of one thousand two hundred people in the population. You can see it here. A um, thousand two hundred people in the population, and this is the number infected at a given time. Okay, um, Is that a good situation or a bad situation? How would you describe the circulation of infection in the population? It's really, really hot. Okay, let's go see what's going on in the clinics. After all, they recover through the clinics. So we're gonna go look at a clinic. Here's a clinic. By the way, I think that second graph up, by the way, is capacity utilization, right? Um, yes. So here's what's going on in the clinics. People are walking into the clinics. Remember, people seek care when they are in when they are infected. When they're in a state infective and symptomatic. So when they're in this state, only then will they go to the clinic. That's what this guard says. In order to make this transition, they need to be infective and symptomatic. We could have used in state, by the way. And when they arrive there, they'll be under care and they enter uh, when they when they go under care, when they arrive, they will go into the clinic. That's what this is. And having gone into the clinic, that's what's going on here. So what's going on here is that we have people coming in. I apologize for the aesthetics uh, of those people who have come in about one point two million have left via this pathway. OK, and uh, there's uh, right now. Let's see how many clinics there's just there's just zero there's zero there's just one clinic only one clinic. Fifty two thousand people have been treated, of whom fifty one thousand were successfully treated and twenty seven hundred were not were not treated. What's the healthcare worker utilization? That's what this statistic is. It's ninety four percent. That's actually what's shown in that graph. I'm pretty sure. Um, this this graph here, ninety four percent. Is that right, Moid? That's that's correct. Yeah. So, so folks, um, how would you describe this clinic situation? So we saw the infection mm -hmm. in the population at a very high level. What do we see for this clinic? It's busy. It's busy. Give me one metric by which it's busy. The utilization is huge, right? It's about 95%. Another metric by which is busy is the vast majority of people leave without being seen because they're waiting over six hours. Six hours, you know, and, and they, they, they're out of there. Hmm? Now, we could change things. We could add a healthcare worker. If we added a healthcare worker, how do you think would modify things? Anyone? Okay, so we're going to add a healthcare worker. Now we have two. Well, they seem to be, uh, the, the, you know, they're treating them. They're 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 all in use, right? Get out a third. Still pretty maxed out. They're they're getting treated, but. Hmm. 
you can see actually the number of people who are ill, has it come down or gone up when we added those healthcare workers? It actually went down. Yeah. But has it totally, has it made the situation, you know, um, brought it down under control? No, the utilization is still above 99%. <laughs> the healthcare workers are like totally pegged. They can't even eat lunch. A bit like someone else. Um, okay, let's add a clinic. We're going to add two clinics. Did that help? Yeah, I brought down the number of people infected. The prevalence of infection went down to 700. Up, oh, more blink. Yeah. We needed like a Greg button. Um, it brought it down briefly, and then it, it bumped back up. Hmm? Have we brought it under control? Let's add another clinic. Have we brought it under control? Okay. Bring it down. Capacity utilization is dropping, right? Brought it down to, to zero, right? And, and, and draining out. Okay. So... You can't control. Let's let's do some controlled experiments though, because we added people to a clinic. We added, we added added clinics. Let's 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 um have this baseline scenario. Uh, we saw that went way up. It it was just totally pegged without it. Let's do a um a case where we have here. Uh, let's let's run it just adding clinics. Okay, so I'm going to. Run it. We're not going to add more people to any one clinic. We're going to have apples to apples. We'll just add clinics. And I'm doing this for a reason. Okay. Here we go. So, so here we go. We'll start it up. Um, and you'll notice it kind of kicks around for a while. Oh, what happened here? What happened here? Yeah, it, it, it happened to die out. We were very lucky. Let's try it again. Very, very lucky. Okay. We're going to we're going to run it again um and that time it didn't it didn't get established this time it didn't get established right it died out just by chance things happen there's happenstance in the world right it just things line up and and it's lucky now once it gets established it's a much better, worse prospect. Do you think it's getting established here? Yeah, look at that S-curve, right? Okay, so let's add clinics. We have one clinic now. In fact, you can see it. Uh, where Where's the clinic? Uh, it's right here. <laughs> it's like all the people's lives are directed around it. They're in a concentric circles. It's like the sun in a Copernican view of the, the universe. Okay, here's add clinic. We have two clinics. Did this bring it under control? Two clinics? Mm -hmm. Three clinics. Did that bring it under control? Yeah. Remember before we were adding people to a clinic too. So let's, we're just asked how many clinics we need. Did this bring it under control? Is it kept at low levels? Is the capacity utilization still reasonable? No, it's like 99%. Let's try four. Better, right? I think, I hope you're realizing there's this interplay. Public health here, the prevalence of infection in the population, people's homes, is entwined, intertwined with, entangled with the clinical delivery, right? The fact that it's bad in one means that it can be bad at the other, right? What goes on in the in the clinic influences what's going on at the public health level because people need treatment to recover. At the same time, the reverse is true too. What's going on in public health pegs the clinic if it's too hot. Yes, yes. Yes. It will indeed. And we're going to examine exactly that right now, in fact, okay? But it's something which could be very readily, extremely readily done. And actually, it would be quite easy on a fixed schedule if you told me exogenous schedule, put it in at these times. Absolutely. So 
Four clinics, is this enough to bring it totally under control? Look, we basically have utilization one. They're basically always busy, right? Okay, here's five. Did it improve? Did five improve it? Yeah. Now we only have what? Like a little bit less than half of the population infected. Is the clinic still busy? Yeah, it's like they're, they're busy like a very large fraction of the time. How about six? Did six bring it down pretty well under control? What just happened? It went extinct, right? Six. And now we're going to address Christina's question. Six, six, right? Took six clinics to bring it under control. Now I want to ask you, what if we took this and we're going to specify instead, I'm going to copy, I'm going to paste here. Hmm? So I will say um, uh, alternative clinic count. And I'm going to say six clinics. Do you think do you think it'll be brought under control if I if I start with six clinics from the start? Will it be brought under control? Hmm? I see people surmising. Yes, let's let's just verify that. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. Since your yeah population are affected, it's going to be so small. You're you're likely yeah. that you'll just kill it. Likely you'll you'll just kill it, and, and we we could we could simulate it many times. Um, but uh, it's actually going to um, be quite reliably uh, knocked out um, within in, in, in a quite short time. It'll it'll snuff it out quite quickly. Um, it'll uh, eliminate it. Okay. Um, there we go. Um, and we could run it many times over. We'll find tomorrow really nice ways of doing this. But but for now we could you know, brutally do it by hand. And we'll find that if we ran it 10 times, it will die out 10 times. Six, six is enough. How much is enough if we start with these clients? How if we go down to five? You think five will be enough? Was five enough before? Five? Was was that enough before? Not when it's full blown. Now, I don't want to was full blown. Let's see if five is enough to, to do it. Okay. Um, there we go. Okay, what I think could have been fluke. Run it again and again. And it turns out I, I could sort of cut through this, but turns out this will snuff it out reliably too. Five claims. From the start, we'll snuff it up. How low can we go? Okay. Okay, it's taking a bit of time. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, it's taking a bit of time, but then it went extinct. Okay. Um, four clicks? Maybe four? It's like a game of limbo. Um, how low can you go? Right? Um, okay. Goes out. And the gist of it is you can do it for a much smaller number of clinics if you have them in place from the start. Why is that? Why does it make a difference if you have them rolled out initially versus only over time? Why is it much better to have them from the start? Anyone? Catching them before the exponential you know, progression has you know, yes. lost the threshold. That's right. Yeah, there's a lock-in effect that occurs. If you have them only after the fact, right, it gets up to very, very high levels of prevalence. And that level of clinical care will not be enough to deliver for that service load. If you have them at the start, before that level of service node is ever needed, you can prevent that level of service node from ever being needed, right? Um, and it will be sufficient to prevent it. 
So we, we talk about lock-in phenomenon when we have a situation which remedying it after it's been initiated, after it's in place, is much harder than preventing it in the first place. And that's exactly what this situation is. This is a situation where if this infection is established, it's much, much harder to wipe it out. We need six clinics. Whereas if you have those clinics in place uh, at the start, it may take a bit of time, but you can end up wiping it out and it will never go exponential. It will never rise to that do you remember that curve where it went and then it went like this and it and it and all hell broke loose? It went to very, very high levels. Um, you can stop that that transition from happening with far fewer clinics. A stitch in time saves nine, right? Um, um an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. We know this in many other spheres, right? addictions, issues, mental health, um, concerns, you know, on the, the homelessness front often um, with adverse childhood experiences and trauma, et cetera. Um, it can be, might not be easy to head it off prevention wise, but it can be so much better than pick up the bag after the fact. And this is a phenomenon of complex systems. They have different, so, this is a system which has two different equilibrium. One equilibrium, um, when it when you when you we run it from the baseline, it has it has two equilibrium possible. Um, one equilibrium is at very high levels of infection, and it doesn't come about every time. But there you go, you're going to that equilibrium. This equilibrium is state is safe. It's like a, a basin of attraction. It's like a, a lake at the bottom of a valley. And to get out from that, up over the mountains to the other equilibrium, which is a disease-free equilibrium, it is very laborious. Once you're in here, you're stuck. Sort of like a cycle of addiction or cycle of poverty, et cetera. By contrast, if you can head off getting there, you know, with, with a more modest amount of resource, you can prevent that from ever coming about and you will end up in a situation where there'll be another equilibrium, which is the disease-free equilibrium, where it's where there's no infection in place. And if you have, you know, three clinics, I think it's three or four, you can, you can in fact uh, reliably get you know, be robust for any outbreaks and prevent it from going viral in, in that way. So this is described more fully in this um, uh, in this uh, experiment here. Um, and, uh, uh, oh, so it's actually two clinics that suffice, two instead of six is enough for prevention. Two clinics instead of six later. Yet we have a very reactive healthcare system often, right? um, all too often. And, and uh, as a result, so much more money gets spent remediating after the fact rather than dealing with it up front. And it has a lot to do with what Jared mentioned earlier. Nobody ever gets credit for putting up fires that never, or for preventing fires that never happen. It's hard to get credit, it's hard to get the resources to build the two clinics when the when the load seems very low, when the demand seems very low. But if you don't get those in place, it can transition to a much higher adverse state where two won't nearly be enough and you'll need six. This is a this is a lesson of complex systems. And this is one model that illustrates it. But please also note this intertwining of what we're trying to emphasize here, service delivery, oops, not that one. That's not what we want. Of service delivery and population health, right? Um, it's, it's this one, service population. What type of modeling do we have simulating service delivery here for the clinic? 
You said it earlier. What type is this? Discrete event simulation. What type of modeling is illustrated here? Agent-based. And the next eye of them is quite simple. When they arrive at the clinic, when the agent goes to the agent called clinic, they put themselves into its workflow. That's what this does. It says, take me into your workflow. Mm -hmm. Take them in here. And here, when they confer, they, they try to treat it. If it's successful, we have to tell the agent that they're cured. And it's a little bit of a, come on, how do I? Okay, wait, how do I get this this icon to? If it's the hand of a cursor, it'll move the icon. Okay, how do I? The arrow cursor. And how do I get the hand? The, oh, yeah. here. Uh, okay, that's neat. Do I do it with control, I guess? So turn I, it. I don't know if there's a modifier. Okay, okay. In any case, in, in order for them to get treated, they need to receive a message. And what is it that receives the message or that sends the message? It's the clinic. The meth, the clinic sends a message. Oops, sorry. Um, sends a message. Okay, so why am I not, um, not, not seeing that here? Um, okay, that's, oh, of course. No, 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 no. Okay, here we, uh, okay, that's odd. Actions. Um, yeah, but it should be dependent on successful treatment. That should be an action, actually. For... But it's it's only on the true exit. Oh, it's on the true exit. Thank you, thank you. Yes, indeed. Thank you, Wave. Everyone needs a Wave. Um, so it's sending the cured message to the agent if it's leaving with true. And the agent here therefore receives, if, it, if it's been successful treatment with that probability of success, they go back to a susceptible state. And then, you know, they leave this uh, service delivery process right here. Easy peasy, clean, sweet. You use the right piece for the job. Agent-based modeling for the interaction of agents. Maybe they could, you could have them going to work, going to the community places, going to school, like we had in our first model that we looked at, if you remember, uh, earlier on day one. Um, circulating among these places, um, exposing each other there. Agent-based modeling is a great tool for them. Capturing their infection status, capturing care-seeking, depending on their infection status. Capturing the fact that when they're cured, they're cured of the infection. But here we have the service delivery components, availability of resources, how long they're waiting, the queuing, the balking if the resources are not available, the outputs of statistics on utilization, or how many people have been successfully treated, how long it's been from one place to another, what have you. That can be dealt with beautifully, elegantly crisply, expressively with the language of discrete event simulation. The two work together hand in glove. And by using each tool for, for each type of need, you can get a lot of insight and you can avoid spending time on things that would take a lot more time in one or another. Could you represent this in agent-based modeling? You could. It would take a heck of a lot of work to represent it. It would it would require a lot of intricate, a lot of intricate logic. There's a much better logic for that. Could you represent somehow infection transmission in the street event model? It would be pretty jank. It would be pretty weird. It would be, I wouldn't want to do it. I, I would refuse to do it. I would refuse to do it. it it's the wrong tool for the job. It would be like trying to saw through a through a piece of wood with a claw of a hand. Um, yeah. Okay. So that's one type of hybrid modeling. It's particularly common and very common in our work. Many published models with this, but more to the point, much value delivered, much insight delivered. Right tool for the job. Have a toolbox, not just the hammer as your only tool.
Okay, we're going to go to lunch now, and we'll reconvene in an hour's time, and hopefully miss the the uh, uh, influx. <laughs> okay, thank you, folks. See you in an hour.